So, before the break we were talking about this particular example, we have a given tree and we have a 3 year 3 percent annual coupon treasury bond and we need to ascribe a value to that bond. This is the graphical dep uh, depiction of the tree at t equal to 0, the interest rate is 3 percent, this rate covers the period from 0 to 1. For the period from 1 to 2, the interest rates could take any of two values 5.788 percent or 3.8. 88 percent both, uh, both are equally likely and both are forward rates. Then at t equal to 2 for the period from t, uh, t equal to 2 to t equal to 3, uh, the interest rates could move either from 5.788 to 10.7383 percent. This would be the rate for forward rate for uh, t equal to 2 to t equal to 3 deposit or it could go from 5.788 percent to 7.1981 percent uh, for the uh, period from t equal to 2 to t equal to th 3. Similarly, from the lower node at t equal to 1, uh, the interest rate could go up to 7.1981 or it could go up to 4.825 percent. So, let us now talk about the valuation of the bond. We have discussed the the interest rate tree that we have with us. Let us talk about the valuation of the bond. Again, we move we work by backward induction, we start working out the value of the bond from the last or the uh, final cash flow ascribed to the bond or arising from the bond that is the maturity cash flows. Now, this is a 3 year bond. So, we start with the cash flows at t equal to 3 years. At t equal to 3 years, what cash flow are we going to get? We are going to get back the principal that is 100 uh, assumed of course and we are going to get a coupon payment of 3 percent on that face value of 100 that is the total cash flow that will occur at t equal to 3 is 103. And this cash flow is going to occur irrespective of what the interest rates. So, in each case we have a cash flow of 103. Now, what let us work out the value of this cash flow at t equal to 2 corresponding to each path that it could take uh, or the interest rates could take uh, for the period from t equal to 2 to t equal to 3. That means, if this particular value materializes, then we have to discount 103 at this rate and we arrive at, at the value at t equal to 2 of at t equal to 2 of 103 divided by 1.107383, which is this value. So, this is the value at t equal to 2. Let me repeat, this is the value at t equal to 2. If the interest rate from t equal to 2 to t equal to 3 takes the value 10.7383 percent. If the interest rates do not take this value, if the interest rate takes the value 7.1981 percent at t equal to 2 for the period from t equal to 2 to t equal to 3, then this 103 will be discounted at 7.1981 percent and the value that will that we will arrive at at t equal to 2 corresponding to this interest rate is 96.08. And finally, if the interest rate at t equal to 2 for the period t equal to 2 to t equal to 3 take the values 4.8250 percent, then this 103 will be discounted at this rate and we shall arrive at a value of 98.26. So, this is shown in this particular diagram 93.01 corresponding to the interest rate of 10.7383 percent, 96.08 corresponding to the interest rate of 7.1981 percent and 98.26 corresponding to the interest rate of 4.8250 percent. Now, we move one step back backwards, we have got the we have got the values of the bond at this at t equal to 2, but at t equal to 2 there will be a coupon payment as well of 3 uh, three rupees or 3 units of money. So, that has to be added to the valuations that we have received from the discounting the value at t equal to 3. In other words, uh, the value at t equal to 2 which we need to carry backwards for discount through discounting or for discounting will be equal to the value that we have obtained from t equal to 3 uh, through discounting 
plus the coupon value that is there at t equal to 2 because this additional cash flow is also going to occur this is going to add value to whatever is the value of the bond at uh, t equal to 2 by discounting the cash flow that is going to occur at t equal to 3 using the interest at f 2 3. So, in each of these cases uh, we need to add the coupon rate of 3 percent and then discount the total cash flows for example, 93.01 will become 96.01 and then it will be discounted at 5.7883 percent. Similarly, 96.08 will be plus 3 it will become 99.08 and then it will be discounted at uh, 5.7833 percent. So, we, we get uh, the two valuations corresponding to V 1 U and we take the average of these two values to arrive at the uh, value of the bond at T equal to 1 upper node. Similarly, we do the valuation for uh, T equal to 1 lower node by discounting 96.08 plus 3 that is 99.08 at the rate of 7.1981 percent and 98.26 plus 3 that is 101.26 uh, at the rate of 4.825 percent. And we arrive at the values at the lower node by taking the average of these two values at the lower node of at t equal to 1. This is given here V 1 u is equal to 93.01 this value that is plus this is the coupon payment and the discount rate is 5.7883 percent 5.8 uh, percent I am sorry and the second valuation is taken by 96.08 and this again this coupon is added uh, uh, of 3 units of money and again the discounting it is at 5.7883 percent and we get 90 and then we take the average of these two and we get the value at t equal to 1 upper node and that is this valuation. Similarly, we get the value at t equal to 1 lower node that is equal to 96.43 and finally, we bring it back from t equal to 1 to t equal to 0 using the spot rate which is which is 3 percent. Here is the spot rate of 3 percent, here is the spot rate of 3 percent and again in uh, because we are going to have a coupon payment at t equal to 1 of 3 units of money, whatever the value is here for example, this is at the upper node this is v 1 u this is v 1 l and we need 3 units to add 3 units on account of the coupon payment that occurs at t equal to 1 and then discount this whole thing by the rate spot rate that is 3 percent and then take the average. So, this is how this figure of 94.485 which uh, which is the value of the bond at t equal to 0. This is how we arrive at the value of this bond using backward uh, induction. So, this example uh, comprehensively illustrates the, uh, the method of backward induction. Now, need and relevance of the binomial model I, I had briefly touched upon this for bonds with embedded or you see this model has primary applications the, the main purpose of developing this model is to ascribe a value to bonds which are embedded with some kind of options. So, for bonds with embedded options the future cash flows are uncertain as they depend on whether the embedded option will be in the money and hence exercised. So, if, if if the, the if the bond is uh, embedded with a call option or a put option then depending on what the price uh, estimated price or, ex or expected price at a particular node is we need to determine whether the option that is option feature that is attached to the bond is uh, exercisable or not and if it is exercisable then obviously we need to re reorganize or modify the cash flows that are going to arise from the bond because this 
the exercise of the option will naturally change the cash flows uh, uh, that are uh, incorporated or that are embedded in the straight bond. So, whether the option will be exercised depends on the interest rates because interest rates have a direct impact on the prices of the bonds. Higher the interest rate, lower the price and vice versa. So, depending on what the interest rates are at that point in time at which the option becomes exercisable, uh, it uh, needs to be decided uh, or it would determine whether the option ends up in the money or out of the money and if the option is in the money naturally the presumption is that it would be excised. So, whether the option will be excised depends on the interest rates and the consequential bond value at the excise rates. Thus, the underlying cash flows from the option are dependent on the future interest rates. Therefore, the value of the option and hence that of the bond depends on uncertain future interest rates. Hence, to value bonds with embedded options, we have to allow for rates to fluctuate. This, this facility, uh, this flexibility is not available in the arbitrage pricing model and therefore, the development uh, or the devising of the binomial pricing model. One way to accomplish this is to use the binomial interest rate tree. We shall take up the valuation of bonds with embedded options in a later section. Pathwise valuation. Now, this, met this method is equivalent to backward induction. Let me tell you at the outset that this method, the pathwise valuation is equivalent to backward induction. What we do in pathwise valuation, the value of the bond is calculated correspond to corresponding to each path. In the backward induction approach, what did we do? We had the cash flows uh, corresponding to the bond or arising from the bond at the maturity of the bond and then we from there, we moved backwards one step in time and then we calculated the value at the various nodes uh, at time say t minus 1 if t is the maturity and then using those values and the coupon payments arising at t minus 1, we worked backwards again and arrived at t equal to capital T minus 2 uh, point and there we did the valuation and this process we continued backwards until we arrived at T equal to 0. However, this is a slight variant. This is a variant where we consider each path in isolation, each path that the interest rate uh, tree has in it, embedded in it and corresponding to each path we arrive the, at the value of the bond at T equal to 0 and then we take the average over all the paths. Let me repeat what we do here is we identify the various possible paths that the interest rate uh, interest rates could take along the interest rate tree and corresponding to each path we do the valuation of the bond and once we arrive at the value of the bond corresponding to each path at t equal to 0, we take an average over all the possible valuations over all the possible paths and that gives us the final value of the bond. So, let me read it out. In this approach, the value of the bond is calculated corresponding to each path that interest rates could trace over the given number of periods and then an appropriate average is taken over all those path values as I explained just now. This will be more uh, uh, clear from this particular example. The interest rate spectrum or the interest rate tree is the same that we encountered uh, at the beginning of this class in the example that we discussed at the beginning of this class and the problem is also the same. X wants to value a 3 year 3 percent annual pay treasury bond using the pathwise valuation, the interest rate tree is here. Now, obviously, there are four possible paths. We can go from 3 percent at t equal to 0 to 5.7833 percent at t equal to 1 and then to 10.7383 percent at t equal to 2. Let us say this is this is path number 1. The second path could be 3 percent at t equal to 0. 5.783 percent, 883 percent at t equal to 1 and 7.1981 percent at t equal to 2. The third path could be 3 percent at t equal to 0, 3.8800 percent at t equal to 1 and 7.1981 percent at t equal to 2 and the final path that is the fourth path could be 3 percent. These are possible paths. Please note, these are not actual paths. We do not know the actual path because we are doing working out this problem at t equal to 0, not at the maturity of the instrument. 
So, 3 percent at t equal to 0 that is the fourth path, 3 percent at 3 t equal to 0, 3.88 percent at t equal to 1 for the period from t equal to 1 to t equal to 2 and then 4.825 percent from t equal to 2 to t equal to 3 and this is a 3 year bond that needs to be valued. So, for a 3 year bond there are 4 pot uh, potential interest rate paths that is what I mentioned just now. The value of the bond for each path is computed as the sum of the present values of each cash flow discounted at its respective path specified rate, pathwise valuation discounts cash flows one year at a time using one year forward rates similar to the backward induction rather than spot rates. So, let us see how this, uh, this is the tree uh, that you recall. So, uh, let me just brief you on how we are going to do the valuation. Uh, now, here in this case we shall proceed from uh, uh, left to right. Uh, let us start with the first path that I mentioned 3 percent operates from t equal to 0 to t equal to 1. Therefore, the cash flow at t equal to 1 that is how much is the cash flow at t equal to 1? It is simply and only the coupon payment of 3 units of money. So, the 3 units of money will be discounted at 3 percent and we get what do we get? We get 3 divided by 1.03 plus at t equal to 2 we get another cash flow of 3 units of money uh, which is the coupon payment that occurs at t equal to 2 and we discount this at the appropriate forward rate. What is the appropriate forward rate? 5, 7, 8, 8, 3 percent. So, into 1.03 5, 7, 8, 8, 3 plus. Then what is the cash flow at t equal to 3? The cash flow at t equal to 3 now please it is 3 of coupon and the redemption of the principal of 100. So, the total cash flow at t equal to 3 is 103 and it will be discounted corresponding to the first path. Please note this is the first path. corresponding to the first path, what will it be? It will be 1.03 into 1.05883 So, this is the value that that is the path valuation for first path that is the first path. Let me repeat at t equal to 0 the we will do the valuation and the first step in this particular path is at a t equal to 1 when we get a cash flow of 3. So, we discount this at the interest rate 3 percent and that is my term number 1. Then we move from t equal to 1 to t equal to 2 there again I get a cash flow of 3 that is the coupon payment. So, I discount it further at the relevant rate which in this case in this path is 5.7883 percent. And then finally, at t equal to 3 I get a cash flow of 103 which will be discounted in this path at 10.7383 percent and this gives me this is term number 2 and this gives me term number 3. So, this is the total value of the bond. Similarly, if I work out the value of the bond corresponding to the second path what, what will it be? Uh, let us work it out uh, for uh, uh, clarification. Uh, we start with t equal to uh, t equal to 1, the cash flow is 3. So, 3 divided by 1.03 plus at t equal to 2 again there is a cash flow of 3. So, 3 divided by 1.03 and what is the second path? The second path is this and then uh, this and then this. So, this is equal to 1.03 into 1.03. 0.5883 and finally 103 divided by 1.03 into 1.05883 into 1.071981 1.071981 
So, this is how this is the valuation as per part 2. Similarly, we will do the valuation for part 3 and then part 4 and finally, we will take an average of all these 4 values that will give us the, v, uh, the value of the bond at t equal to 0 that is v 0. This is the working this is the working of this uh, problem um, which I, uh, I have uh, I explained uh, in the earlier few minutes. Mm, this is how we arrived at the value corresponding to the first path, right? And uh, this is the first path valuation. Similarly, we have the second path valuation and the third path valuation and the fourth path valuation as well. And then we take the average of all these four paths. Now we start a new topic. We talk about valuation of bonds with embedded options. This is where the actual beauty of the binomial tree model manifests itself, it becomes apparent uh, the utility of the um, binomial tree interest rate model becomes more obvious when we talk about valuation of bonds with embedded options. So, embedded options in a bond allow the issuer to manage the interest rate risk and issue the bonds at an attractive coupon rate. Uh, in fact, I would go to venture to say that not only the issuer, but the depositor also has the opportunity to measure manage his portfolio to introduce flexibility into his portfolio if the bonds have putable options attached to them. And the embedded options can be a simple call or a put option or more complex options such as a state put or provisions for a sinking fund. I will come back to them one by one. Callable bonds give the issuer of the bond the option to call back the bond. So, when a bond has an, has a, has an option attached to it, has a choice given to the issuer of the bond that he can call back the debt, he can call back the borrowing, that is he can return the money and he can uh, call back the bond, then it is called a callable bond. So, obviously, uh, an issuer would consider exercising the call uh, when the interest rates are uh, falling, when there is a decline in interest rates as a result of which the price of the bond has increased. And also, uh, if the issuer has plans or uh, looks uh, finds an opportunity to replace his existing debt, uh, which is at a higher rate by a lower cost debt, which is the now prevailing interest rate. In other words, if the interest rates go down, if the interest rates go down uh, at a certain point in time during the life of the bond, the 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 bond issuer with the bonds which have a callable option uh, can exercise the call option and call back the bonds, repay them money and borrow the money from somewhere else at a lower rate. That is a possibility that can be considered provided the bonds carry a callable option. So, what is a callable option uh, or what is a what is a callable bond rather? A callable bond is a bond that has attached to it or has embedded in it an option which gives the right to the issuer of the bond to call back the debt that is to pay the money and withdraw the bond uh, at uh, as per terms contained in the issue document. The so, most callable bonds have a lockout period during which the bond cannot be called. Now, obviously, uh, as I mentioned some time back, call options are basically of two types, uh, the European option and the American option. European options are excisable only at a particular date and American options are excisable at any time during the life of the option. So, the call options that are embedded in the embedded in the bond can also be of two types a European style option whereby the option can only be accessed on a single day immediately after the lockout period or an American style option whereby the option can be exercised at any time after the lockout period. Of course, we can also have a Bermudan style option where the option can be exercised at fixed states after the lockout period. So, we can have a European style option call option embedded in a bond, Amer American style option embedded in a callable bond and a Bermudan style option embedded, but embedded in the callable bond. But the important thing is whatever is the nature of the option, whatever is the maturity of the option, at what point the option can be exercised, on what terms the option can be exercised, 
uh, what, at what price the bonds can be bought back, all these things must be structured in the offer document. It is not that one fine morning the issuer of the bond wakes up and says that I want to call back, call back the debt and uh, return the money and call back the bond. So, that is not allowed. Everything relating to the terms of excise of the option, the excise price, the excise date, or the method of excise uh, and all other modus uh, 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 are need to be specified in the offer document. So, that is what uh, callable bonds are about, callable bonds are bonds which give, give the uh, flexibility, give added flexibility to the issuer of the bonds whereby he can call back the bond before its actual maturity whenever uh, as per the terms of issue. Now, the option the fact that it is called an option please note means that the issuer has the discretion, the issuer has the choice whether to exercise the option or whether not to exercise the option. It is not that uh, uh, it becomes a necessary component of the uh, issue that uh, the issuer must prepay the money or uh, on the uh, option date, option excise date and call back the bonds. No, that is not the case. Issuer has the discretion either he may excise the option, he may repay the money and call back the borrowing or call back the bonds or he may let the option lapse and let the debt continue up to its uh, normal maturity. So, that is why we use the word option. Putable bonds give the investor, give the lender the right, the discretion to give back the bonds and recover the money from the issuer as per the terms contained in the issue document. So, that is the difference between the callable bond and the putable bond. Uh, a callable bond, the issuer has the discretion, the issuer has the choice whether he wants to pay back the debt and call back the bonds. Uh, in the case of putable bonds, the investor has the discretion, the investor has the choice. If he so wants, as per the terms of the issue uh, document, if he wants, he can return the bonds to the issuer and take back the money that he has lent to the uh, issuer of the bonds. So, just one, uh, just to reiterate, callable bonds means the issuer has the discretion, the issuer has the choice to give back the money and call back the bonds. In the case of putable bonds, the the lender has the choice to give back the bonds and take back the money. Then we have extendable bonds which are uh, bonds whose maturity can be extended at the discretion uh, of the investor rather not the issuer. So, but the valuation of an extendable document is uh, bond is pretty much on the same lines as the as the portable bond as uh, I will explain in a minute. Uh, let me read it, read this out first. A related bond is an extendable bond which allows the investor to extend the maturity of the bond that is to extend the maturity of the debt. It does not want the money back uh, for at the uh, normal date of maturity or the actual date of maturity of the bond and is, he gets the right, he has the option, he has the discretion to ask the issuer to continue with the borrowing until a future date. So, an extendable bond can be evaluated as, as a putable bond with longer maturity. You see, let us take an example. Let us say we have a two year putable, a two year extendable bond in which the, the life of the bond can be extended at the choice, at the discretion, at the instance of the investor for a further period of one year to a total of three years. Then we can value this bond as a as a putable bond with a maturity of 3 years with the early exercise of the put at t equal to 2 years. So, the framework that we have for the valuation of putable bonds is pretty much, uh, ex, uh, pretty much implementable, implementable uh, in the case of valuation of extendable bonds. Complex options, we have the estate put and estate put includes a provision that allows the heirs of an investor to put the bond back that is to give back the bond to the issuer on the death of the investor. So, this if on the demise of the investor original investor, the heirs of the investor get the right, get the discretion, get the choice to mm, deliver back the bonds to the issuer and take back the debt to close out the debt. The value of this contingent put option is inversely re related to the investor's life expectancy. The shorter the life expectancy, the higher the value. Uh, sinking fund bonds, uh, sinking fund bonds, the, these are sh normally called sinkers, require the issuer to set aside funds periodically, normally out of its profit and loss accounts, uh, of out of the operations, pro uh, profits arising from operations. 
set aside funds periodically to retire the bond uh, and create a sinking fund and this provision reduces the credit risk of the bond. So, uh, if such a provision exists in the issue document, the issuer of the bond has the mandate is required uh, to at, at the uh, at the end of each year to set aside a certain amount out, out of his profits, out of his operations for the redemption of the bond. Of course, the, the funds that are kept aside that are separated uh, that are uh, segregated out from the profits need may be reinvested in uh, appropriate securities uh, short term or long term instruments depending on the maturity of the bond. So, that on the date of maturity of the bonds these instruments can be liquidated and the proceeds utilized for the payment of the bond. So, this gives additional protection to the persons who have lent money to the issuer against the bonds which are sinking fund bonds. Now, we talk about the relationship between the values of a callable or a puttable bond comma the underlying option free that is the straight bond and the embedded option. This is quite simple in fact. Let us recall what is a callable bond? A callable bond is the bond where the issuer of the bond has the discretion, has the choice, has the prerogative to decide to call back the debt and and uh, call back the uh, bond and give back the money to the person who is holding the bond. So, this is the property of the call option. Of course, it has to be accessed I reiterate it has to be accessed in terms of the provisions that are contained in the issue and document we need to take care of that. But the important thing is that the prerogative or the right lies with the issuer not with the investor not with the lender. Therefore, uh, from the lender's perspective he is short in the call option, he has written the call option and the issuer has bought the call option, the issuer has the prerogative. So, he is long in the call option, the lender has the obligation that if the issuer calls back the bonds, he has to give back the bond and take the money that the lender is going to give him as per the terms of the issue document. Then therefore, the lender is short in the call and the issuer is long in the call. Therefore, from the perspective of the lender what happens? The value of the callable bond is less than the value of an equivalent bond which does not have the call option attached to it. Uh, in, let me repeat the value of a callable bond from the is less than less than I reiterate the value of the bond without the call option because the issuer ha, is uh, uh, because the uh, investor rather is mandated is dictated, is ordered, is obligated to perform an act at the discretion of the issuer. So, from the from the from the perspective of the lender, his rights are curtailed, and as a result of which, he is uh, uh, he pays less for the for the callable bond compared to a bond which does not have that option, which is called a straight bond. So, in other words, we can write this in the form of this equation here. This equation value of the callable bond is equal to the value of the straight bond minus the value of the call. This minus sign is very significant. Why minus? Because the investor is short in the call option therefore, we have the minus sign here. And in, in any case a call option is an obligation from the perspective of the investor and therefore, he, pay, uh, he demands a price for that, he demands a cut for that and as a result of which the value of the bond with the call option is lesser than the uh, than the value of the straight bond by the amount of the call. However, the converse is the case when we talk about portable bond. Why? Because what is the portable bond? The portable bond gives the right to the investor, gives the right to the investor to uh, the investor has that right, no, he does not have the obligation. The investor has the right to give back the bond and demand his money. So, that prerogative works with the investor therefore, he is willing to pay a price for that and as a result of which the value of the portable bond becomes more than the value of the straight bond with the amount of the put. Putting it in another way the uh, investor is long in the put option uh, and the uh, the 
the seller or the issuer of the bond is short in the put option. Now, because the investor is long in the put option, because he has an additional right, because he enjoys an additional flexibility under the put option, which he may or may not exercise. It is not mandatory that the investor exercises the put option, he can as well let the put option lapse. And therefore, uh, because of that discretion, because of that choice, uh, what happens is that the investor has uh, uh, pays a price for the put option and as a result of it the value of a putable bond value of the putable bond is equal to the value of the state bond that is without the put option plus this plus is significant uh, value of the put option so let me repeat in the case of the call option the value of the call option callable bond is less than the value of the straight bond by the amount of the call or the amount of the value of the call rather and in the case of a putable bond the value of the putable bond is more than the value of the straight bond by the value of the put option so this is where we conclude for today's lecture we'll continue from here in the next lecture thank you